Why, hello, and thank you for joining me. Today I have some very important information for you to know, potentially, should you ever find yourself in an emergency situation. This information will prove to be invaluable and very well could save your life or the lives of those you love around you. And who knows, perhaps even a stranger. Anyways, without further ado, here it is. Listen up. Might save your life. Boom! Hey, what's up, guys? This is horror author James Hershey Jr. from the Staring into the Abyss radio show. And this is going to be another of my survival videos. And this one is going to be very interesting, and it might just save your life one day. This video is going to be on how to make homemade penicillin. Now, right from the beginning, I want to stress that unless you are in a survival situation where there is no other option, you want to go see a doctor. So if the world is the way it is now, and there are hospitals and doctors and ERs, then you definitely want to go to one of those and get a professional to treat you. But if you're in a situation where society has broken down, or, you know, a zombie apocalypse or some crazy situation like that, and you get an infection, you're going to be in big trouble. Now, infection can come from like pneumonia, something like that, or it can be something as simple as you cut yourself. You know, you're trying to, to cut wood and you cut yourself, or you're trying to make food and you cut yourself, whatever, and the wound becomes infected. Now, in a situation like that, if, if it is a end of society kind of situation, then you're not going to be able to just go down to the hospital. So you're going to have to figure out a way to deal with that. Now, if you have been wise enough to stockpile antibiotics, then you will have them on hand and you won't need to do this. But this video is to teach you how, as a last resort, you can create penicillin at home by yourself without having to go to a hospital if none's available. And in a situation where you're going to die from an infection, then this, this is the way to go. It might save your life. Basically, all you really need to do this is a couple things that you probably have laying around the house anyway. Um, you can do this with like an orange or a piece of bread. It's really simple. Basically, all you do is you just let them sit around and age. You can put them in, in a container or a, a plastic baggie or something and just let them sit there and they will begin to to grow mold once you've put the the bread or the orange into your bag or your container then you just let them sit there and spores will begin to form on them spores of mold once this happens and the spores have begun to form you want to take your bread out and you want to break it up into smaller pieces in this example we are going to be using bread you can do it with oranges as well, but there's not as much of a process with oranges. You just kind of let them sit around and then you peel the mold off of them. But we're, we're going to do this example with bread. So you're going to take your bread and you're going to put it into a plastic bag or into some sort of container. It can be like a Tupperware kind of container or whatever, just something to contain it and keep it from getting wet. You're going to let it sit there until spores begin to form on it. Now, once the mold begins to form on the bread, you want to take the bread out and you want to break it up into a lot of little small pieces and you want to put it back in your container and you want to add a little bit of moisture to it. Now you don't want to get it soaking wet, but like if you have like one of those little spray bottles that does spritzing, you know, for, for like spritzing your plants or, or like spritzing oil on a salad or something, something like that'll work. You just want like a light misting of the bread and then you're going to seal it back into the container or the bag. Now you want to monitor the mold growth and you're not going to take it back out for a long time. Basically, you want to monitor it and watch the mold grow until the majority of the mold turns green. Okay, because you're going to have multiple different colors of your, of your mold because as mold begins to grow, 
it will it'll be white, blue, and green. It has three different stages. Now the green mold is what you want. That's the good stuff. It begins being white, then it will turn to blue, and then finally the end stage is green. At the end stage of green, that means that the mold on your bread has matured. And that is exactly what you want because the green mold is going to contain doses of penicillin. Now, once you have the, the green mold that has the penicillin in it, you can begin to use it as a treatment pretty much right away. Now, there's a few different ways that you can do this. The first way is you can take a large cup and you can put some of the bread clumps that have the green mold on it in the large cup and you can add warm water to it. Now, you don't want to do boiling water because that could damage the, the spores, but you want to use warm water. And then you're going to mix that all together and then drink it. Well, drink slash eat it because it's going to have chunks of bread in it. Now, you're going to do this as often as you need to do. Basically, you're pretty much going to do it once a day to have your daily dose of penicillin to help you get better. But in a more severe case, you can do it a couple times a day. Now, one thing I need to stress, very important, is... You are growing mold, therefore you are growing penicillin. That's a great thing. But while you're growing this mold, you are most likely growing other things as well. And not all of the things that are growing on that bread are going to be helpful and good for you. Now, when you consume the bread, you are getting the penicillin, but you're also getting all that other bad stuff that you've grown with it. And it's going to taste like crap. I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to be gross. But... In this situation, what we're talking about, there is no other option. So you're just going to have to suck it up and deal with the bad taste. Now, what the stuff that you've also grown, the other bacteria and stuff that you've grown on that bread, they're going to give you probably diarrhea and an upset stomach. But that's really a small price to pay to save your life because you're talking about something that could turn into a major infection and eventually death. So I guess it'll be worth it. Now, this method of doing it has been used for thousands of years in all kinds of different ancient cultures and it's also uh, seen in many of the folk remedies that are around the mountainous areas of the United States and in the south. Now that's the first option. That's the easiest way to do it but it's really gross. The second option takes a little bit longer. You, you take your time and you're going to carefully separate only the green mold from the bread. Okay, so you're not going to have the bread, you're not going to have any of the other colored stuff, only the, the green mold is going to be separated and that's what you're going to use. And if you're talking about a wound, okay, if you've cut your leg or cut your hand or something like that, then you're going to take that green mold that you've separated out, and believe me, that's not as easy as, as you would think it would be. You'd think it would be easy, just cut the green off, but it, it takes a lot longer than you think. You're going to take that green mold that you've done and you're going to clean the wound, and you're going to put them on the wound. You're going to put that green mold on the wound topically, like you're using it as a wound dressing. And then you're going to wrap the wound up with gauze or, you know, bandages, whatever you have. Pads work great in this situation, like the ones women use when they're on their period. Wonderful, wonderful bandages. You're going to wrap it up, and you're going to repeat this, this process often, as often as you need to, um, anywhere from every couple days to every day, depending on how much mold you have on there and depending on the wound. Another thing you can do with wounds that isn't penicillin, and it's not going to help an infection, but let's say you cut yourself and you don't want it to become an infection, okay? One neat thing you can do is you can put honey on it. I know that sounds crazy, but this is something that comes from ancient Egypt all the way back to uh, Imhotep. Now the doctors in ancient Egypt used to actually dress wounds with honey because it's extremely hard for bacteria to grow on honey. That's why honey lasts forever. I mean, there, there is honey that they found in the tombs in Egypt that was put there back in ancient Egypt time and is still edible today. So honey, because bacteria will not grow in it, it'll last forever. So that's a great, a great food source as well to think about. Maybe getting some bees and learning how to do, do uh, beekeeping or just stockpiling honey before. Because it's, not only can you eat it and it's really good for you, but it's also good for, for dressing wounds with. There are other ways 
of making penicillin from bread and oranges. If you have more time, more resources, then you can make almost pharmaceutical grade penicillin using this same basic process. Uh, it doesn't really cost much to get penicillin now. You know, in modern day, it's easy. So this is not something, once again, that you should be doing in an age where there's hospitals readily available in every town. But if you're in a situation where you cannot go to the hospital because they don't exist anymore, and you're, you're in one of those up against the wall situations where you've hurt yourself, this little thing here could save your life. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this. A uh, little, I guess you could call it a survival hack. I don't know. It's it's something that, that is really good for a end of the world kind of situation or end of society at least situation. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, please hit like and subscribe to the channel. And until I speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. I love you. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Joe Alton, MD, retired physician, but very active medical preparedness writer. Together with my wife, Amy Alton, a nurse practitioner, we're the founders of the survival medicine website, www.doomandbloom.net, where you'll find 700 articles, podcasts, and videos on medical preparedness for any disaster. We're also the authors of the number one Amazon bestseller, The Survival Medicine Handbook, the New York Times bestseller, The Ebola Survival Handbook, and the designers of Doom and Bloom Survival, a fun way to get the whole family interested in the preparedness mindset. Recently, I read an article warning people about the risks associated with fish antibiotics. Certainly, in normal times, you should always consult your doctor prior to using any medication. However, I write about disasters and survival settings where there are no doctors or hospitals available. We must figure out strategies to prevent avoidable deaths if we find ourselves one day off the grid without modern medical facilities or professionals. As a physician and an aquaculturist, I'm perhaps in a unique position to speak on this topic. I spent years as a tropical fish breeder and was president of an international hobbyist organization. As well, I raised tilapia in my pond to investigate their potential as a protein source in times of trouble. In my role as a physician, I have many times prescribed antibiotics to patients with bacterial infections. As an aquaculturist, I've used antibiotics for piscine bacterial infections, such as fin rot. For many years, I didn't see any need to evaluate veterinary antibiotics for human use. However, as I became interested in medical preparedness and became one of the first physician writers on the topic, I realized that many deaths in survival settings could be avoided by the availability of antibiotics in the kit of the survival medic. I came to this conclusion after watching the History Channel offering After Armageddon. In the program, the Johnson family has survived the pandemic and is bugging out. They encounter a number of obstacles to their survival and eventually join a community. The father injures himself doing activities of daily survival and incurs a cut that becomes infected. The town has unfortunately run out of antibiotics and he, a paramedic, slowly dies as a result of the spreading infection. In my opinion, this was a useless death that could have been avoided if the community had prepared by storing a sufficient supply of antibiotics. But how? The article I mentioned recommends getting human antibiotics from your doctor. Your doctor may give you a prescription for 20 pills, but that would run out very quickly in a survival setting. You need a source of antibiotics that you can accumulate in quantity if you expect to run into a long-term collapse of the medical infrastructure. Don't expect your doctor to give you a prescription for 100 pills or even any if you don't currently have a bacterial infection. Understanding the need, I took a second look at some of my fish antibiotics. I examined a product called Fishmox Forte. This fish medication contains only one ingredient, amoxicillin, 500 milligrams. Investigating further, I found that it's produced in only two dosages, 250 and 500 milligrams, the same dosage used in humans. Hmm, why does my guppy need a human dose of amoxicillin? There were no instructions regarding the size of the aquarium, so it was the same for a half gallon bowl as a 200 gallon setup. This piqued my interest, so I examined a sample of human amoxicillin 500 milligrams 
produced by Deva Pharmaceuticals and compared it to a sample of Fish Mox Forte, the 500 milligram version. The human capsule was red and pink with the numbers and letters WC731 on it. Fish Mox Forte was a red and pink capsule with the numbers and letters WC731 on it. Make your own conclusions. I found a number of fish and bird antibiotics that met my criteria. They had only one ingredient, the antibiotic itself, nothing to make your scales shinier or your feathers brighter, were only produced in human dosages, although they're meant for fish and birds, not many in those hobbies that are the size of a human, were identical in appearance to antibiotics produced by at least one human pharmaceutical company, and were available without prescription and could be bought in quantity. It was clear to me and verified by readers who worked in the pharmacy and veterinary industries that they were the exact same products taken from the same batches produced for humans. This wasn't true of all veterinary antibiotics. Some had additional ingredients that gave benefits to certain animals. Others were in larger doses that are not advisable in humans, for example, horse medications. As such, I don't recommend adding them to your medical storage. The article I read asked the president of the Society of Veterinary Hospital Pharmacists if he would personally take veterinary meds. He said that if FDA approved for dogs and cats and it was safe for people, yes, he would feel comfortable taking it. I assume he would make his own determination as I did that it was safe for people. Since I doubt there's any government statement that it's fine to take dog and cat medications. You may ask, are these fish and bird antibiotics FDA approved? Of course not. They're marketed towards the pet industry. And what company will go out on a limb and say the human should take them? There may be little government oversight, but why would companies use the identical appearance and identification numbers if they're producing a different lower grade product? It's simple enough to just use a different colored capsule. Could fish antibiotics be different in some way, even if they meet my criteria? If so, the same could be said for human generic medications. They must have the same active ingredients, absorption, and elimination, but may vary by up to 20%. Most generics are perfectly fine for human use. So let's go back to the important question. Would the fish and bird antibiotics I write about be a useful addition to your survival medical storage? Some deaths may be unavoidable in a situation without rule of law, but does it make any sense not to have medicines that could possibly prevent an unnecessary death? Of course, you'll need to study antibiotics and their use and indications to be able to make a difference as the medic for a survival group. Antibiotics are not something to use injudiciously, and veterinary antibiotics are no different. Indeed, the overuse of antibiotics is a cause for an epidemic of antibiotic resistance we see today. 80% of these meds are used in livestock, mostly to speed growth rather than to treat disease. One other issue. The director of the CDC is talking about an increased stewardship of antibiotic availability in the United States. Although their aim is to prevent the spread of resistance, I fully expect more regulation and less availability of fish and bird antibiotics in the future. They'll probably even have to look different for the pharmaceutical industry to stay out of trouble. These changes will likely occur soon. If you can obtain antibiotics in quantity now, you should consider it for use in survival settings. Having said that, don't use them in times when doctors exist to prescribe standard medications for bacterial disease. They're no good for viral or fungal infections. You'll need to be able to recognize bacterial infections to use them effectively. This isn't always easy. Learn more, get them while you can, and you might save the life of a loved one and keep it together, even if everything else falls apart. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Find out more about antibiotics in our Amazon best-selling book, The Survival Medicine Handbook, available at Amazon.com, or get a personally autographed copy at our website at www.doomandbloom.net. Also, check out Nurse Amy's entire line of disaster medical kits at store.doomandbloom.net. We wholeheartedly support our nation's efforts to get people prepared for disasters. Visit ready.gov for more information on how to succeed even if everything else fails.